Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. Today is Thursday, April 27, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., Research Librarian and Archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. And I will conduct this oral history with pioneering writer Butch Tu. Butch, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, greetings. My name is Butch Tu uh, from the New Graph Nation. Uh, carrying a torch for some of my fallen brothers, like Solid One, Case Two. Greetings. And today we have the distinct honor of documenting an oral history for Topaz One, a true pioneering writer and artist. Welcome, Topaz. Please introduce yourself. Thanks for having me. My name is Topaz One. Proud to be from the Bronx. Great, great. We like to start all our oral histories you know, asking about if you can please talk about your family history, background, and where your parents are from. Uh, my mother, she's from Spain. My father was from uh, Georgia. They met in Harlem. And then we moved to the Bronx. So we grew up on, uh, actually we started living on uh, 1098 Union Avenue, which was the first place we lived which is still South Bronx, but then later on we moved to Hewitt Place, which is in the Fort Apache section of the South Bronx. Back then, anyway, they called it Fort Apache. Right. Nice, nice. You know, back then, do you remember at home the type of music your parents listened to that influenced you? Yeah, so in the early years, my mother listened to, like, Nancy Wilson and Otis Redding. But then, I'll tell you, in the 60s, James Brown became, basically James Brown and Aretha Franklin were the two big stars in our household, at least. Aretha Franklin, I think, she, I don't know how many albums she had, but my mother had a whole, a whole list of Aretha Franklin, Aretha Franklin, Aretha Franklin, and James Brown. That was, that was basically the two big ones. There was other music out there, like later on, we had Blue Magic, the Delphonics. Because we grew up on love songs, you know, we, we grew up in romance, a romantic time. So a lot of the stuff was either say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud because we grew up in a culture that was proud of our culture or, you know, um, Blue Magic, which was basically the love songs. Because you know, when we were young, we had house parties and we used to like to slow dance with the young ladies and sing into their ears. That was a big thing back then. Awesome. And so, wow, with, with, with a mother from Spain and, and a father from the South, can you tell us about any meals that you recall having, any of your favorite meals at home? Well, my favorite meal has always been rice and beans. But, you know, it was everything from rice and beans to, you know, soul food, which would be yams, potato salad, collard greens, that type of stuff. And, you know, made a lot of pig soup and pigtails, but I, I never ate that stuff. Certainly, I never ate it. But they made that kind of stuff. I, I don't need it. Okay. All right. You, you mentioned you, you were from uh, Fort Apache over in the Hunts Point area. Could you talk to us and tell us about your earliest memories of growing up in the Hunts Point area? My earliest memory, um, I guess, was in Union Avenue. Uh, a guy, I remember being sleeping and being awakened by a guy coming because my father was a super of the building. So, one night I was sleeping, and I could see this guy climbing in my, my bedroom window. So he carried out the television. You know, it was popular to take television back then. So he took out television, he climbed up the window, went back in, took the radio, went back out. Then, because uh, my father was drunk, knocked out sleep. My mother woke up and caught him. He punched my mother in the face and knocked her out. Then he poured gasoline down and set our house on fire. So the next thing I remember was a fireman carrying me out. And looking at the firemen, and ever since then, I used to be in love with the New York Fire Department. Because I remember my youngest memory is a fireman saving my life. Wow. Wow, that is, you know, that is an interesting story. Uh, can you talk to us about, you know, um, some of the earliest neighborhood games you remember playing as a kid? Oh, man. We played... Uh, Handball, stickball, softball, slug, um, Ring Olivia, Johnny on a Pony, Books. The 
which was with basketball. And we played basketball. We didn't, you know, the thing about basketball is we had a, um, we made our own basketball court. It was actually a church on our street, and there was a window. So we broke up a chair, and we put it on top of this window, and that was our court. We played there every day. So we played basketball. We played kick the can, Johnny on the pony. And then, you know, when we went to day camp, we played wiffle ball and different things that the day camp offered. And as kids, we played skeleton. I mean, we, we didn't have internet or anything back then, so everything was about the street game. With the girls, we played run, catch, and kiss. You know, you chase the girl, and if you catch her, then you can kiss her. And you know, the girl, she always made sure you didn't catch her if she didn't want to kiss you. So it was a fixed game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. And uh, wow, you know, uh, you spoke about the story of your, of your home burning down. Did, did you end up moving to a, uh, a new neighborhood after that? Not even neighborhood, you know. After we left, because we, our house burned on Union Avenue, so we, the family was split up because we didn't have any place to go. So my family was split up. Me, my older brother Ernie, and my older sister, she, we went down to our father's relatives in Georgia. Unfortunately, in Georgia, they still had Jim Crow laws, which we didn't know anything about that being from the Bronx. So my brother went into an all white store, not knowing that it was an all white store, just trying to buy some bubble gum. Mm -hmm. The guy refused to serve him because he was black. And like I said, we didn't know he was So my brother got pissed off and went outside and flagged down a police car to tell him that the guy wouldn't serve him. So the police, you know, told my brother to get the hell out of the neighborhood. So we didn't understand until we went back to my aunt's house who told us, listen, you can't. You can't do that. You have to leave town because they're going to come after you. So we got chased out of Georgia in the middle of the night and wound up back in the South Bronx. My father went to, went to jail for killing the guy that set our, ho our house on fire. Okay, so going back to the Bronx in Georgia, and uh, my mother had a boyfriend named Mr. Paul. My father was in prison. So he got into a beef with a guy, uh, stabbed him, uh, knife went through the ground because you know back then in New York the summertime was really hot and the ground got soft the street was really soft so the knife stuck in his body he went to jail so basically it was just me and my brother my two sisters and my mom who moved into an apartment that wasn't all ours because back then you couldn't afford well I, I say we couldn't afford it I'm sure people could but we couldn't afford our own place so generally the tenements in the Bronx you could be 15 people in an apartment so for us, it was our family and another family that lived in that apartment. And back then, you know, it was like when you got a telephone, it was like shared through more people in the building. You didn't have your own telephone. Mm -hmm. Like we had a phone, but we shared the phone with the people upstairs and the people downstairs. So if the phone rang and you answer it, it could be for your upstairs neighbor. That's just the way things were in the Bronx back then. So... That's how it was when we first moved to the Bronx. And my first memory really was 63 when President Kennedy got assassinated. I remember watching the television and seeing President Kennedy get assassinated. And that was really a sad thing, at least for us in the Bronx during those days. Right, right. Now, you know, we spoke about your house burning down, but you lived through the era, you know, unfortunately that's referred to as the burning Bronx. Can you describe your life in the Bronx in the late 60s and early 70s? Did you witness any of that? Well, before we get to the burning, let me talk about the hippie movement, because a lot of people don't talk about the hippie movement, but we were influenced by the hippie movement. Now, think about this. First of all, one of the, one of the cultures of the hippie movement was a name change. They would become hippies, and they would change their name to, like, Moonchild or some cool name and they would drive these Volkswagen buses and write their names on the buses and draw art on the buses. They played music and they were like free love, smoke weed, everybody loved everybody. And they were protesting against the war, make love, not war. So I cannot go on without saying that the hippie movement definitely influenced us in terms of their writing their names on the buses and changing their names. 
because we also had that in the Black Power Movement, which was also going on. But the hippie movement was, like I said, when you had the Civil Rights Movement, which was a violent movement, at the same time you had the hippie movement, which was a peaceful movement. So we had both flavors going on at the same time, which also influenced us. Like I said, I think the hippie movement was what really influenced us toward the love songs. Because we had guys like James Brown who came out with a song in the 60s called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. So that kind of gave us, because you know, there wasn't a lot of black artists or really I attribute all of it to, um, a lot of it to, you know, Don Cornelius and Soul Train. When the late 60s came out with Soul Train, where we got to actually watch, because there wasn't a lot of black people on television anyway. First of all, television only had three channels. So there wasn't a lot to watch. But when Soul Train came out, it kind of gave us something to identify with in terms of people of color on TV and with the music and the dancing. And then simultaneously, you had the hippie movement with the Make Love Not War and the, the buses that were always some kind of fancy paint colored bus. They, they always had music and a song and drugs. They got high and everybody was about free love. So I think that was a big influence on us on the, on the 60s besides the other stuff the hippie movement. I just thought that was important to mention. Definitely. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, getting back to any of those memories of the 60s and, and 70s growing up in the Bronx, those earliest memories of, of the burning Bronx. And okay, so the burning Bronx. You know, thinking back then, it seemed like fires was just a normal part of life back then. I mean, there was just fires all the time. We were used to hearing the sirens. And it was kind of like, you know, waiting for your building to burn because uh, it seemed like everybody at some point had a fire you know and most of the time it was set but sometimes it was just due to um you know the situations with landlords where they wouldn't fix stuff like you know growing up on, on Hewitt Place where, where I lived um it wasn't abnormal to be sitting on the toilet and look up and see the person who's sitting on the toilet above you that was just normal you know, every once in a while, the ceiling would break. So seeing the person's upstairs bathroom was like a normal way of life that we had to adapt to. You know, rats and roaches. I remember when I first started getting a mustache and I woke up in the middle of the night and there was a rat eating crumbs out of my mustache. Oh. <laughs> that really pissed me off. So we got this, we went out and got a, we went out and got a stray cat from the street to bring in the house yeah, yeah. <laughs> to deal with this rap problem. <laughs> so, you know, but like I said, you know, those were bad things that happened, but you know, we had a fun, you know, there was no air conditioning, you know, in hundred degrees in the Bronx, sweltering humid weather, you know, rats, rats and roaches, but you know, we still went outside and played. You know, you came home from school, Mom, can I go outside? Take off your school clothes. Yep. <laughs> Put on your play clothes. <laughs> and then you go outside and play, you know, you can play with the, the other guys in the neighborhood. You know, outside was your life. You, you, that's all you did. Can I go outside? Everything was outside. Or, you know, entertainment was looking out your front window. You could sit out the window for hours and just be entertained about whatever was going on in the street. So there's a lot of good memories. You know, there's some bad stuff that happened too. But like I said, we didn't we, we didn't pay attention to the bad stuff. We we had fun, in spite of. Beautiful, beautiful. Could you take us through the schools that you attended and tell us a little bit about each of those experiences, elementary, middle, on up? Okay, my first elementary school was PS one thirty, which was only a couple of blocks away. We just walked down there, and um, my memory of that was I was always a pretty good student. Um, but I think I, I remember being a kid for some reason, I got addicted to cough syrup. I don't know how that happened, but you couldn't have cough syrup in my house. You know, anytime my mother had cough syrup, I would always douse the whole bottle. So one, one day coming home from school, I think I was in first or second grade, I doused the whole bottle and wound up passing out. And my mother rushed, had to rush me to Lincoln Hospital. Back then, Lincoln Hospital had a nickname called the Butcher Shop. So she took me to the, which, she, which we called the Butcher Shop, and they pumped my stomach. But um, school itself, 
I don't remember much about it, but I can tell you this. I remember when busing started, mm -hmm. you know, and for, for people who don't know what busing, what busing was, they put us on buses and bust us uptown to the white schools. So we was, we was some of the, me, my family, my, my two sisters, we were some of the first kids to get bused to the uptown school. So I left PS130 in the South Bronx and what was bussed up to PS105 up north. But still went to day camp mm -hmm. at PS130. And day camp, there was a couple of reasons to go. Day camp was a place to go where you could play sports. Day camp was a place to go where you could like hang out with the other kids. But mainly for us, day camp was a place you can get lunch. Because mm -hmm. you know, welfare back then, there wasn't no food stamps. There was, you go, you take your shopping cart, you go to this location, the government would give you an allotment of two weeks of food. And you would take that shopping cart and that food was never enough. There was no way that food was enough. You would have to be on a diet for that food to be enough. So we always ran out of food, but that's the way welfare was back then. Also, welfare used to come to your house to make sure you didn't have a television. You couldn't have a television if you were, you couldn't have a man living in your house. So that's why a lot of women were single and wouldn't allow men to live with them because welfare didn't allow a man. You couldn't have a telephone. And the social worker used to come to your house to check, to make sure you didn't have these things in your house. In a Hewitt place, we kind of had a, a, a written code where if a, cause most of the social workers were white. So if a white person came in the block, everybody would yell, Welfare, welfare, and everybody would start hiding their televisions because they didn't know who they were going to visit. So people would start hiding their televisions because if they caught you with TV, you got cut off. So welfare was a lot different back then, which made it a lot worse in terms of just running out of food. So a lot of things we were trying to get back there, like, you know, we just trying to eat, basically, just trying to get a meal. So day camp was a, a way we could have lunch on a regular basis because Meals wasn't guaranteed at home, for sure. Yeah. How about your middle school experiences? So I got bussed up to junior high school 127, which was on Castle Hill Avenue. So that was an experience because the white boys uptown didn't want us in the school. So one of the kids in my class, after, because, you know, sometimes you have to stay after school for after school programs. So one of the kids in my class had to stay late and the white boys caught him, they killed him. Mm. And in the morning they hung his body from the lamppost. Mm. So when we came to school the next day, we would see his body hanging and we would quit the school. So we did see his body hanging, but you know, when I told my mom what happened, she was like, listen, take your ass to school. You're not getting out of school. So we still had to go, but they didn't want us uptown. So, you know, that wasn't a picnic being up at uh, being bused to school because there was other problems that that caused. Even though it was better schools, like I said, the neighborhoods didn't want us there, so we had a lot of problems because of that. And actually, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I was in the spades, black spades, because they were only they were from Bronx River projects. So most of the guys in in my school were from Bronx River. So I hung out with them just for protection reasons, you know, because like I said, it wasn't. It wasn't like they invited us into their neighborhood. They didn't like us being there, and they let us know that. Did you take any art classes in school? Did that have any impact on your writing at all? Yeah, you know, art, art back then was just, you know, that was part of school. You know, art, physical education, music classes. You know, that was part of our education. And me being from the South Bronx, going to a white school that was, wasn't as, I mean, I can say we were, we were I, would, I would call us wild. We didn't know we were wild. We were just being our natural selves. But I noticed that when we went to other parts of the Bronx or other parts of the state or other parts of the world, people were like more laid back than we were. So the stuff we did that was normal to us, other people thought was crazy. Like in seventh grade, you know, I was talking in class and then the teacher turned around and says, who's talking? And nobody said nothing. But one of his kids squealed on me. So after class, I twisted his arm until I heard it snap. 
Mm. Now, that wasn't a big deal to me. I was like, okay, why are you mad? Because I broke this guy's arm. I mean, I didn't think it was a big deal because in the South Bronx, everything is, you know, this is how we do things. But I got suspended. So that's one of the things I didn't understand about coming out of the South Bronx, how the comparison to other neighborhoods and other schools and even other cities, which I later found out, oh, they don't do that kind of stuff. This is not normal. Because I thought it was normal, just normal everyday stuff, because this is how we live. But um, I would say that the busing was a good idea because it did help me get a better education. I never thought I could, you know, even graduate high school, let alone live to see high school. So once I got to high school, because I went to Theodore Roosevelt on Fordham Road, mm -hmm. which was a black and Puerto Rican school. But by the time I got there, I was so advanced in knowledge and education, so much so, I never carried a book in high school and still got the highest mark in my class on the English regions without even studying. So whatever I learned there did help me, even though it was rough. Mm. Right. You spoke about the Black Spades. Could you tell us your memories about becoming a member of the Black Spades? Well, I, my loyalty was to the Hewitt place. We had, a, we had a crew called the Hewitt Place Boys, which was later called the Ghetto Wolves, before we were called the Ebony Dukes. And my heart was on Hewitt Place because Hewitt Place was my block. Hewitt Place was my, you know, up there was away from Hewitt Place, and I wasn't going to get the guys from Hewitt Place to come and defend me on Castle Hill Avenue. So that's the only reason I had the association with the spades, was school. But my loyalty really was to Hewitt Place because that's where I grew up. These are the guys I grew up with. These are the guys I went to day camp with. These are the guys that, you know, um, we shared our food. You know, I don't know if you interviewed Dynamite 161, but, you know, he couldn't have company, but because it was so hard for us to get food, we go to his house and he used to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and sneak it out to me. So these are the memories I have of Hewitt Place. So all of my loyalties and ties were really on Hewitt Place, even though I rolled with these guys. When they rumbled, I rumbled with them because I was with them. But ultimately, ultimately my heart was still on Hewitt Place with the Hewitt Place boys. Okay. Yeah, I, I read that you had gotten a concussion during the Oh, yeah. Run. So what happened was um, this was kind of like the early Savage Skull days. Because what happened was when we lived on Hewitt Place, we lived like on Hewitt Place 161st. So if you went down the other side of Hewitt Place to like 156, that was Savage Skull territory. Mm. Unfortunately, that's where the day camp was. So we had to go on Savage Skull territory to go to the day camp. So when things kind of started getting territorial, I got caught there one day and... Uh, you know, one of the things, you can use anything for a weapon in those days. So one of the things we used was belt buckles. So everything you had on your person became a weapon. So it was, it, you wore a belt just for the fact that it could be a weapon. You carried a stick because it was a weapon. You know, everything was made into a weapon because violence was inevitable. Either you were going to get, somebody was going to jump you, you were going to fight. So it was always anticipation. So in anticipation, I always wore a thick belt buckle, but so did they. Mm -hmm. So I got in a fight. I got jumped, really. It wasn't really a fight because I didn't do anything. It was just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they had belt buckles. I had belt buckles. So we had a belt buckle fight, and they won. I had a concussion. I was hospitalized. Right. So that ultimately ended because my brother... And his best friend, Michael, caught the guy, brought him back to the block. But that, my father was still alive back then. And they held the guy, and my father pistol whipped him, and they let me watch. So that's how that was rectified. Speaking about the Hewitt Place boys, how did that crew start? And you were associated, how did it begin? Okay, so my sister was dating a guy named Bobby Guyton. And he was the one that really started the Hewitt Place boys in the ghetto wars. Um, I think Jojo was the vice president back then. But once again, like I said, block crews basically were different back then. It was just kind of like a, a block thing where you were just standing up for the, 
authority of your block. We weren't trying to, you know, take territory like other gangs or whatever. We were just basically in your place, boys. Just our block. Don't come on our block. You know, protecting our block. So, you know, that's that's what it really was. And because I was from the block, and plus my sister was the, the girlfriend of the president, you know, I became close with him. And he's actually the first one that taught me, started, I should say, started teaching me about hand, hand, hand fighting or boxing. She was street fighting. I mean, probably today, nobody ever heard of street fighting. But back then, we had what was called street fighting. You know, so he was the first one to start teaching me about street fighting, mm -hmm. which got me in, later on into boxing. All right, all right. And we're definitely going to get to that later on in the interview. Uh, can you tell us about the beef your crew had with the Jackson Avenue Project oh, Boys? Yeah. I think the guy's name was Percy. Um, I, don't, I think the guy's name was Percy. And JoJo, our, our vice president, had a beef with this guy. So we were supposed to have this rumble. And um, ultimately, it was settled, like a lot of beefs were settled, just those two fighting. What if countries would do that, you know? Get Biden to fight <laughs> against Putin, Putin or whatever, <laughs> instead of bringing the country into it. But that's how a lot of things got settled, and that's how that beef got settled. It, it got settled with a one-on-one, -on -one, with a one-on-one -on -one fight, because we were kind of anticipating, and like I was saying earlier, I said, you know, a lot of things that we would call ourselves rumbling over was stupid, you know, just dumb stuff that really, it shouldn't have never been a beef, but whatever. Right, right. Ultimately, you know, um, it, uh, the, the black crew broke up and, you know, it turned into something different called the Ebony Dukes. All right. And that's, that's the next question. How'd you become one of the original seven members of the Ebony Dukes? Well, my memory is this, because, you know, like I said, we had a lot of street games that we played, and I don't know if we were playing Ring of or basketball, but, you know, we were we were always together. Um, so I remember one day we were outside, it was myself, Staff 161, his brother, All Jive 161, Dynamite 161, and King Cool 156. And we were just, no, not King Cool 156, um, me, Staff, Adam, uh, Paul, and Danny, okay. I remember better names than street names. Mm -hmm. And Ed said, you know, we're going to have our own crew, you know, because we were looking up at the trains and, you know, kind of saying, because at first we were amazed at Subway, because, you know, we used to write on walls, especially the church. We had a church on our block where we practiced our graffiti on. It was just a nice clean wall. Well, it wasn't clean anymore. Because that's basically where we practice and develop our graffiti skill on the church across the street, which was also our basketball court. So we stood there and looked up at the trains and we saw what we thought was amazing because, oh, uh, this one name used to go across the train every day, Super Cool 223. Every day we see this Super Cool 23. And we were like, you know, we should give up these walls and move it to the train. But it wasn't just a thing of moving into the train. It was like Ed wanted to organize and have a crew because, you know, we were all in gangs. So we kind of like kept that idea of gang, but we didn't want to do the violence and the rumbles that gangs were doing. We wanted to be a gang that went out and conquered the New York City mass transit system worldwide. That's, that was our vision. Like we're going to be all world and we're going to be all over the place and and that's what we tried to do. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. And I really was more into fighting because I still like to fight. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't that into writing, but like I said, the people I hung with, Adam and Ed and Danny, they were really into writing. So I was like, I wanted to be with them. So I followed them. So that's what we did. I still continue to box, but you know, I followed them on the trains. And uh, Ed taught me how to do my first piece on going um, from 180th Street. We went down the tracks into the 180th Street yard, and that's where he taught me how to do it. I did my first piece, and he said, I don't like that. And he, he crossed it out and made me do it right. So he was really kind of like a perfectionist. I don't know if he still is. Probably is. But he was kind of like a perfect. He wanted everything perfect. He didn't, you know, so he was like that. But he taught me how to do pieces. And from there, 
Um, my best friend was a Puerto Rican guy on our block named King Cool 156. He was my best friend. So he became our writing partner. So me and him, because we were trying to, at that time, take over the New York City transit system. So Ed and Adam and Danny, they were doing the twos and the fives and the fours. So me and, we called him Cookie. We started doing the double E trains and the six trains because we were trying to spread our organization citywide. So while you had guys doing buses, you had Adam and Ed and Danny doing the four, five, six. Well, four, the two, five, and the four, I was mostly on the six line and me and uh, King Cool 156, we started going out to Queens and going into the double E tunnels. So we basically were the first, because there was no graffiti on the double E's when we went out there. So we started doing top to bottoms and just hitting, killing the double E's until we got chased out of it. We started getting chased out of the tunnels. Then we went back to the Bronx. Wow, wow. And at this point, Butch II, a pioneer of graffiti, is going to take over some graffiti questions to his colleague and yeah. counterpart. Let's, let's talk some graph for a little while. Do you remember when you first saw writing and where it was at? Well, the first writing we saw was, like I said, gangs in our neighborhood, just writing their gang names on walls. You know, Savage Skulls used to write Savage Skulls, Ghetto Brothers, you know, Savage Nomads, Roman Kings, Black right. Spades. Everybody was marking their territory. Right. But like I said, for me personally, my first writing that influenced me was the hippie buses because the buses were multicolored and they had big peace signs in multicolors on the, on the van and they would have their name on the van. So that's the thing that influenced me most seeing these hippies with these weird names with, on these buses going by, you know, and I was like, wow, that's, that's so cool. So that was kind of like my, the thing that got me kind of fantasizing about having a bus with my name on it. Yeah, but, but um, you know, in the streets, and then, you know, you start seeing guys like Tacky183, where his name was everywhere. Yeah. And I could never understand that, why this guy's name was every, and when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere mm -hmm. you went, Tacky183's name was on the street. I'm like, what is this, where is, does this guy just drive around all day? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that kind of amazed me about this guy, Taki183. His name was everywhere I went. Taki183, Taki183, Taki183. And I was like, this guy, man, he must not get any sleep writing his name because <laughs> everywhere, mailboxes, you name it, his name is there. So I would say from the street perspective, Taki183 was like, you know, he was a big deal to me. What did you use to write your first tag? Can we, I guess the first thing I could say I used was shoe polish. You know, we used to get shoe polish and it was really drippy though. But you know, you couldn't, I mean, we didn't have money. So a lot of guys used to either steal a, what was called a pilot marker or use a, just a easy little marker or something. But I think when I first started writing, I used shoe polish because we had that available in the house. So you just took the shoe polish and you used to, you know, have a, come with a little brush and you just write yeah. your name and it was leaking, yeah. but at least your name was up there. You know, you could recognize it. So my first experience with writing was shoe polish. And where was that at? Man? That was on the six train because I went to school when, in uh, Castle Hill. So we took the six train. Right. So I wrote my name every day on the train on the way going to school. How did you get the name Topaz? Topaz one. <laughs> Topaz one. Okay, so originally, I was going to call myself LW because they called me Dub. And the reason why they called me Dub was because my father, they used to call him LW. And L, short for LW was Dub. But I used to hang out with uh, Edward's brother a lot, Adam. And Adam chose the name AJ. So because his name was AJ, I would say, okay, I'm going to be LW. Since he's AJ, I'll just use my initials too. Okay. And Ed, being the perfectionist he is, he said, "No, I don't. I don't like that." <laughs> so I was like, "Okay, what do you what do you want to name me?" And he thought, and he said, "Topaz." I said, "Okay, I know Topaz is a jewel." That's right. I said, "I like that." So I said, "Okay, I'll be Topaz." So I was named Topaz by the president of Ebony Dukes. All right. 
bestowed upon you. Yeah, it was okay. bestowed upon me. <laughs> what other tags have you written, and do you still write any of them? Okay, all the tags I wrote was Eli 3. And the reason why, I just wrote Eli 3 because I got arrested by this cop. Me and King Cool 156, we were at 149th Street in Grand Concourse. And we happened, that was stupid, but we happened to have spray paint on us. And we got searched and we found, they found a penny, so they, they arrested us. So when he asked me what my name was, I didn't want to say Topaz, so I, cause you never give your real name when you got arrested. So I said Eli 3. So I started writing Eli 3 on the four line, just to piss off the cop that arrested me. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't Hickey and Ski at that time. Right? No, that was, uh, there was a cop out there named Schwartz back oh, then. Yeah, I remember. Did you ever go to the writer's bench? And why was the bench so popular? Hmm. I couldn't tell you why it was popular, but yeah, I used to go there. Um, I didn't like to go there a lot because he was always getting chased. You know, when we first started going to writer's bench, it was cool, but after a while, the cops, they wouldn't let you stay there. You know, after about, you know, a couple of trains went by, the cops would come and chase you out of there. You'd be standing on the bridge. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, I don't, I'm not interested in getting chased. So I, I stopped going just because I didn't want to get chased anymore. But we, you know, we went there. I mean, we went there just to hang out with the other guys. But on Hewitt Place, I really, you know, because really, I didn't even, because like I said, Hewitt Place had its own graffiti crew. So as far as I was concerned, we didn't need to associate with anybody else. You know, phase two was from our neighborhood. So he hung out and played basketball with us on Hewitt Place. And that was the only guy that we saw that we admired besides ourselves. Like we weren't jealous of anybody. We had the top writers in New York City in our crew. So we didn't go looking for writers corner to be around guys. They came looking around to be around us. Right. So Writer's Corner, whatever, AJ, Staff, HS575, Dynamite, Dr. Soul, they live on my street. <laughs> so I don't need to go see some of the writers from somewhere else because basically they were our competition. Sometimes if you're on the train, you may look out the window to see who's on the bench <laughs> or something like that. That's about it. Um, what lines did you hit? And what stations did you go into for the layups? What layups did y'all go to? Um, the layups that we went to was uptown on 225th, I believe. 2J. But then there was also a six layup right along with Avenue. Underground. Right, yeah, underground, right along with Avenue. So me and King Cool 156, actually Riff, that's where I first met Riff. We were down in uh, the six train, the layup, me and King Cool 156, and Riff apparently had just been there because his paint was still wet. But he probably got chased because he never finished the piece. Oh. When we got there, we saw a riff piece, and riff had just came out back then. But riff, you know, when he came out, he was he had like a he already had a nice style. Like most of us started out with really sloppy stuff, and we right. kind of got neat. Right, you got better over time. But it seemed like when riff came out, he had already got his style to a place where he was already neat, and it was kind of like annoying to see somebody write that was so good at it, but new. Right. But yeah, you know, so that was one place. And then me and Ed used to go out to New Lots Yard. We got chased, I think, by the Tomahawks out there at New Lots Yard. <laughs> that started happening. Gangs were coming after writers. Yeah, exactly. So we stopped going out to New Lots Yard and then started hitting more layups again. Other than uh, the Tom do you have any other amazing chase scenes? Any police come out of nowhere? Oh, yeah. I'm chased by my moms, you know. <laughs> we, 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 me and King Cool, we went to, um, we, were, we were going to, we were going on a bombing raid, and we got, I got 35 Kansas paint. Wow. Which, which we had paint. planned, yeah, we planned to go out and do some damage. And uh, I had all the paint under my bed. But you know, I haven't had much paint, you can't just hide it, you know, so you had to look at it. Yeah. So I, I had it out and I was counting, I was looking at my different Stand colors. And, yep. and my mother came in the room. Oh. And I got chased. <laughs> 
So that's the only chase I was really scared of, because you know getting chased by cops didn't bother me as much as my mother. Chased that was me. fun, actually. Yeah. As long as you get away. As long as you get away. Right. Well, my mom's chasing me about the spray paint and throwing out all the spray paint because it took us a long time to steal that paint, and she threw it all away, and that was heartbreaking for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You come home and you, you just empty, you be like. Because it takes a lot to get paint. Because, you know, you didn't have money. I mean, I heard of some guys bought paint. I never heard of buying spray paint. Me either. But you had guys that bought paint. Yeah. Today? But, uh, we, we, we stole paint. And, you know, it wasn't easy to steal paint. You had to be good. And you had to make sure you got away with it. Because yeah. you didn't want to get busted stealing paint. Because you had to sneak on the train with the stolen paint. Right, right. Get to the layup. And do what you got to do with stolen paint all the time. It's a whole mission. Exactly. So... You know, it wasn't, it was just, my mom taking my paint was like very deflating for me. Because yeah, it, it took hit. us a long time yeah. to get 35 cans. Do you remember some of the places you used to go to get paint? Did you ever go out to Queens? Yeah, or? we went out to Martins in Queens. We went out to, um, um, there was a couple of stores. Genevieve's Drugs. Genevieve's Drugs. We went to Parkchester. I think there was a, a Martin, North in North yeah, North. Parkchester. Um... There was a lot of stores, but then, you know, they would get hot after a while because after a bunch of guys started stealing, they would get hip to it. So, yeah. So, Ed, I think he invented it. I don't know, but he, he co we did this thing called Bogart. He called it Bogart. Yeah, Bogart. So, so it. yeah, we would go to the store, and instead of trying to shoplift, we would just go in and act like we were looking around, and then Ed would yell, Bogart. So then we would, because we would have shopping bags with us. So we would take the bags and stuff it with the paint and just get out of there before the guy called the cops. Right. And what about the fat tops? Did y'all have to get fat tops? Yeah, so, that paint? so, you know, and that's another thing. You know, the, the, the tops, I think we used to steal them off of um, Jiffy Four. I don't know when we got the fat tops, but I know it was used to get them off the other product because I know today they actually can buy caps. Yeah, I know. But that's not how we did it. You know, there were, there were certain types of spray foams that you could go in the store. You didn't take it. You just took the top off. Right. You took the top, you put the top back on, and you walked out with the right, cap. Right. And that's how we got our fat caps back then. Your foam, uh, Niagara. Yeah, yeah, okay. spray starch and all that. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right, do you recall, did you remember writing on the 3rd Avenue L? Yeah, so we used to go in day camp. Almost every week, at least once a week, we went to Katona Pool. Right so there. Katona Pool was a hangout for us. So because we rode the train, like I said, wherever we went, we just rode our names, kind of to say we were was there. <laughs> like, uh, you know, Kilroy was here or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the 3rd Avenue L was something that we took to go swimming almost every week. So it's just something that we rode on because, you know, it was available. We never, you know, because, you know, you think about it back then, who knew they were going to tear the Third Avenue L down? Right. So you didn't know it was going to become history because you just think it's always going to be there. You know, I remember before they even took the tracks up because, you know, Third Avenue always had the tracks from where the Third Avenue L was. And then after a while, you didn't even see the tracks anymore. Yeah, yeah. And the people today don't even know it existed. That's right. So it was like a memory that you can't really relive because those trains were like older than the other trains. Those trains were really noisy and the doors were huge. They opened and closed. They were huge. And the seats, I think, were still made of straw. So, yeah, we used to ride on the third out of the well. All right. Well, talk to us about getting in and out of your most challenging or dangerous tunnels or yards. Okay, now I'm gonna have to say New Lots Yard because I think it, to, there was like a big wall, if I remember correctly. I've never been there. So once you got in, if you had to get out quickly, you had to jump down this wall and the wall wasn't just like a small jump. So it's a chance you could break your leg coming out of that wall. Right. So we, actually me and Ed was in that yard one night because it's a long ride from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So we rode all the way out there to, to hit the yard. And then we heard somebody yell, Jolly Stompers. And we were like, okay, we got to get out of here. Uh -huh. So we had to jump down that wall. 
And I'm like, man, I hope I don't break my leg. So we jumped on the wall. I didn't break my leg. I was okay. Then we, we got to the train station to hop on the train, and there's a cop at the station. So we had to pull one of these numbers where you have to climb on top of the station, wait for the train, and then get, get on, on top, top of the train, the train to get to get home. Because wow. you know you don't got money, so you you know you just improvise and did what you had to do. But it was an adventure. Yeah, yeah. Y'all made it out of there. We made it out of there though. All right. Okay. Are you known for any specific letter style? Do you have any you know? specific style that you like or that you're known for? Well, I think the way I make my T's with that S, that was always my, the thing that I kind of like started making T's with because I wanted to be different. Like guys had styles. I didn't have the style because I was always impressed with guys like Stay High 149. You know, he had this reefer smoking character. Mm -hmm. The stick man. The stick man. And I wasn't that creative. You know, Staff had his arrow going through his two Fs. Yeah. All Jive had his, because he was left-handed. AJ's left-handed. So the way the he... With the A. With the J. It yeah. didn't always look like that. When he first started writing it, it kind of looked like a dickhead. But I won't talk about that. I didn't talk about that himself. <laughs> but that became um, real legendary with the little heart. Everybody. I'll tell you something, but we didn't know it back then. We know right. it now. But I'm just saying, I didn't really, I wasn't as creative as they were in terms of my own, but I wanted to have my own signature. Right. So I started doing this T with like a S style T. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like my signature. The only thing I had was that kind of S on my T because nobody else had that. You know, I didn't want to copy anybody else, but at the same time, I wanted my own identity. So I kind of had this S on my T. Right. And that was really it. I, I, I made my Z's kind of crazy, but I think it was my, the S on my T that I really kind of like. When people recognize my work from a long time ago, they see that S on the T, they're like, okay, that's Topaz. Okay. All right. Well, walk us through your process of doing a piece. You know, do you uh, plan it out? I do. Uh, do you just wing it? Do you do it in a black book first, or do you get help from other people? When you okay, so pieces? I quit writing in 1973. Wow. And the thing about it is, what people don't realize is, because they talk about 1973 as being the best year. But wow. they, I'm just saying they talk about that. I'm okay. not saying that's true. Right. But for me, when I, when I started graffiti writing, just writing my name, there was no black books. There was no... You know, I mean, some guys, like, I guess when they started really doing pieces, guys started doing the pieces in the books first. Mm -hmm. But when I was writing, pieces was just a new thing. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't no making it in a book first. It was just going out there and really just trying not to go to jail. That was the main thing about doing pieces. And basically what I learned, or I should say what Ed taught me was, he taught me how to do the outline. Because I see guys don't do outlines first anymore. But we did, we, I was taught to do an outline. You outline your name first, and then you fill it in. Then you might put a different color to outline that. Right, right. And back then, it was like you put stars or circles or something. Designs, you make some stuff. kind of design yeah. stripes. And maybe later on, you could put a cloud around it. And it evolved, and it got more and more complicated as time went on. But basically, I quit in the era when we were just doing the right, stars. before it even all began. Yeah, before right. that all began. Because like I said, I was concentrating more on, on fighting because I was always a fighter. You know, I, I liked the street fight. I liked the fight. So I started more in the boxing ring and I let these guys handle the subways. All right, so you was out the game for a long time. Did, yeah. Did, was it these guys that brought you back into the mix? Uh, start drawing again? Well, um, painting, anything? Well, the thing about it was, I didn't know graffiti was a thing. Um, I was in a computer class, actually. And it was up in Buffalo. So the guy, the guy in the computer class was into the history of graffiti. And he started trying to school me about, he was teaching a class on the history of graffiti. Wow. And I'm in the class, 
thinking, what is he talking about? <laughs> you ready to get up? Yeah, so after class, I was like, yo, what, is, what are you talking about? And he, so he says, well, let me take you. So he showed me this mm-hmm. website called So Way Outlaws with all these guys. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I know these guys. And he's like, I'll oh, stop lying. I was like, whatever. <clears throat> he says, well, why don't you email him? So it was a guy named Gilbert Santiago. So I emailed him. I said, yes, sir. My name is Topaz. I'm from the original Ebony Dukes. And he said, well, if you're really from the original Ebony Dukes, write me an interview on the Ebony Dukes, which is what I did that same day. I sent it to him. Three days later, it was on his website. So then I started contacting staff and AJ because they were in prison at the time, letting them know. I said, yo, graffiti is a thing. So it's kind of like, because they were locked up at the time. That's why nobody heard their stories because they were away. And when I found out, I started letting everybody know, yo, graffiti is a thing. So they started kind of getting into it too. All right. So you became like a spokesperson for Graf. Yeah. That's good. At least for our our crew anyway. Okay. And that branches out because Graf is kind of universal. Yes, it's everywhere now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ebony Dukes are everywhere. Are you known for any characters? You got any specific? You mentioned uh, Stay High Stick Man. Do you have anything that's you know? We I had you? a character, and I did a character on the Double E's, but I, I could I couldn't say it was mine because back then it was kind of like a I don't know it, I didn't call it my character, but it was kind of like everybody kind of knew how to do a face. It was like a face. Side view face. Yeah, right? with your name coming out of the mouth. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I started doing that, but I can't say I invented it. I mean, but you might have your own version. You might have a Kango on. Or I didn't chain. have a Kango. I just had the, it had an afro. You know, mm-hmm. it, I used to do a little afro mm-hmm. and the face, just the face. And sometimes I tried to do a, a joint coming out of his mouth, you know, a, a lit joint. Yeah. But it was, I can't say I owned it. I just, I saw somebody else do it, so I copied it. That's cool. That It became like your, did you do it every time, like with your tag? Or? If I had time, if we wasn't getting chased and had time, I would add it on. Because the main thing for me, you wanted to get your name out there. Right. So you always did that outline first. And then once you filled it in and did everything, then you could start adding you stuff on. Back and play because like I said, you're always looking for conductors coming down the tracks or something. Cop maybe or Shit you like know that. or gang members don't want you there. Right, when you used to go paint, was there any particular brands of paint that you like to use? Or? I think we started with uh, Rustoleum. Rustoleum mm-hmm. was really popular back then, but basically it was get anything you can get. You know, whatever you can steal, get it. But Pretty if we much. found Rustoleum or Krylon paints like that, was kind of like the preference. Probably Rustolian because we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to preserve our our, our work. We yeah. wanted to run for a while because really, when it first started, they didn't wash trains, so your piece could run for a while. Right. It could run for years before, you know, somebody either rode over you, which didn't start happening until later when it exploded. Everybody's right going to the yard and whatnot. Uh, where did you get your caps from? Just regular supermarket, probably. Probably Woolworths, because we had a Woolworths right there on um, Prospect Avenue and 162nd Street. So Woolworths was kind of a big store right in the neighborhood that you could probably just go in and get the caps without nobody noticing. Right. So probably well, they see you, they don't know what you're doing because you're putting the can back. Yeah. <laughs> and and which which the ghetto brother reminded me he used to call it five and dime. Right. Before it was Woolworths, right? right. I, I remember Woolworths, but he was saying, "No, it's five and dime." That's but he's true. a little older than me, a couple of years older. So, <laughs> now, who were your mentors in writing? I think I may know the answer, but who? Yeah, were Staff was my only. I didn't really have a mentor, you know. Staff, he was my only mentor in writing, but you know, it was kind of like we were, or like I said, we were already a crew. We you didn't have to. I mean, for Staff to come out and say, "Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have a." A writing crew called the Ebony Dukes. It was just a matter of saying yes, because we were already a crew, because we did everything together anyway. Yeah. So basically, what he was doing was putting a name to an already, crew, already. Yeah. Because like I said we played street games together, Ring Olivia, Kick the Can. We played basketball 
on that makeshift basketball court that was made of a chair every day. I mean, every day. Over at the church? At the church, in the window. Yeah. And on Sundays when they were having service, they used to come out and say, oh, guys, please stop playing because we can't hear our service. And we would say, yeah. And then we went, we went back inside and we would start playing again. You know, thinking back on it, they should have just built us a court because it was a brick wall. They should have built us a court because, you know, we were just kids. We didn't know no better. But uh, that was our, that was our, the hangout was that court. That was our court. And we played serious games there, just like we would do on, a, on any other basketball court. But that was our little court. Home base. Home base. Home base. Uh, what's, the, what's your favorite piece? Tell us about your favorite piece that you did. Maybe on a train, carry. Okay, so my favorite piece was a top to bottom I did on a double ease. Me and Kinku 156. I did a top to bottom whole car, Topaz EXP Express. I remember. Yeah, so everybody started doing Express at the end of their name. So, because we had enough time, because, you know, to do a top to bottom, because unlike a lot of guys, I had a strict mom. So to get out that late, to be on the layup that late, I couldn't do it. So I had to go on the weekends. And a lot of times you're trying to do a top to bottom on the weekends during, you know, daytime hours. You're not going to have as much time. So trying to finish a top to bottom whole car. And I had this um, green paint. And I just finished the Topaz EXP whole car. And now I'm outlining it in white paint. Mm. And then I put some white tiger stripes through it. And then I'm just sitting there looking at it and the conductor start coming down the tracks. <laughs> so we went through, um, one of the, we climbed through this ladder and came out through the street in a, in a, in a grate in the street. But I was sitting oh, you there. was in the tunnel? Yeah, in the tunnel. I remember you had to get up and come out the emergency chair. Exactly. The yellow door. Exactly. So, but I was standing there. I remember standing there looking at that piece and that was, that was I think that was my best piece. And um, there's a guy in Brooklyn that has a picture of it, but you know, he's not giving it up. You, sometimes you find it online. All right, what does the word graffiti mean to you? I don't know what graffiti means because we didn't call ourselves graffiti. We call ourselves writers. Okay. I mean, I never, I never remember ever addressing another writer as a graffiti artist. I know they called us graffiti, but we call ourselves writers. So I never, I never took on that identity as a graffiti artist. To this day, if you ask me about my history, I'll say I was a writer. Because to us, writing meant something. We weren't just, well, in our own minds, we weren't just destroying the system. We were making a statement to the world that, listen, we, we here. That's right. We matter, we count, we're somebody. Even though we're not somebody in your world, we created our own world to become somebody. And we saw ourselves as somebody. So we call ourselves writers. So when people say graffiti, I don't really associate myself with the term because I don't, I don't ever remember calling myself or anybody else I know a graffiti. Uh, you, well, yo, what you write? And they say, yo, I write, I write riff right. 170. Right. Well, I write phase two, I write whatever. But I never heard anybody say, yo, you're a graffiti artist? I never heard that. Maybe in today's world you might hear that, but I never heard that back then. True. Okay. What about that new term? What do you think about that aerosol artist? Okay, so aerosol art, to my knowledge, and I don't know if it's true, but this is what I was told that phase two made up that term aerosol art. Pretty much. So, you know, to us, phase two was just somebody from the neighborhood. Now they have him as an icon and graph, and I get it. But to us, he's just a guy from the neighborhood. So he was always just a guy I'd go up his house and smoke weed with. Uh, you know, he, he was like a brother. So I never went riding with, with Lonnie. I never hung out with Lonnie except for getting high. You know, we never even talked about riding. We just smoked weed together because that was our relationship. Why? Because he lived in Forest Projects and my girl lived in Forest Projects. So I see him every day because I went to see my girl every day. Right. I see him going to school and what's up? We slap hands and we go about our business. 
but because it was him and he's out, he's one of our people as far as I'm concerned, I said, okay, I like that. Only right. because it's him. Right. And I respect and I respected him, you know, for being one of the guys in our in our neighborhood. Right. All right, I'm gonna pass it back to the pastor. Um take from here. All right, so Pat, can you uh, go back and can you tell us a little about your first experiences or your most exciting experiences racking? Racking, okay. Okay, racking, we didn't, I, I can't say I started out racking. I would say started out just happy to get one can. So I think it more started out with a trickle than a racking. Because racking was coming home with a bunch of paint, like the 35 cans. That was a racking. But I didn't start racking. It was mainly going in a local store and trying to get one can or two. Because at that time, it was just about getting your name. We wasn't even doing pieces yet. Mm -hmm. And then when you started doing pieces, you needed something for the inside. And you needed a different color for the outline. So you're looking specifically for certain colors. Because you decide already, okay... I want this piece to be black and purple or black and white. So you got to look for black paint. You got to look for white paint. Now you got to plan on how am I going to get this black paint? How am I going to get this white paint? So you go into a store and you figure, okay, I'm going to do a piece tonight. I need at least two cans for the inside, at least one can for the outside. So you started out, or at least I started out small, small time, because, you know, you always try to wear a big coat. And what you used to do was put it down your sleeve. That was the big thing, at least for that one. Take the can, you walk in the store, you got your coat open already, you put it in your sleeve, and it's in your arm, nobody can see it. And that's how, or you wore a jacket that had a lining that you could put inside the lining of your jacket. Right? And like I said, you were just glad to get one can. But if you went in and out of the store too many times, the owner got suspicious. Right. So we didn't try to rack it first, but like I said, when we started coming to the place where we were bogarting paint, then all bets were off. You just took as much as you wanted. So that was the racking that we that we came to later. But I didn't start out that way. It started out with kind of like one can, two cans, what you can get. But then later on, we got a little more bolder with it. You know, we started getting more bolder with it later on. We got we got into it and used to it. Then it became fun. You know, it became a whole system. Okay, I got to get paint because we're going hitting Friday night. So, okay, I'm going to do a green piece. I'm going to do a white piece. So you already make the plan how much paint you're going to get. So you might have to get on a train, go all the way up to Queens to Martin's Paint to rack up, and then get back to the Bronx with all the paint, hop on the train with the paint to make it to the layup or the tunnel, wherever you're going. And like I said, it's a whole process of before you even get your name out there. Looking at you, you're looking good, Topaz. Can you tell us about any b-boy gear? that you wore growing up, anything significant that spoke to you? I don't know if you call it b-boy gear or not, but you know, the big thing for us was the Lancy Street. Yes. And you know, um, when we were, because after, after, you know, the gang colors and everything, we started wearing tailor-made pants. And we would go to the Lancy Street and get our pants made. You know, you could go down there and he would measure you and go to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And he would measure you and you, and yes, he would kind of style you and say, well, I, want, I want a bun here, I want a flap here. And they would make the pants specifically to your liking. And you either wore, we have maxi coats and midi coats. So you wanted everything to match and you had double knit sweaters. So we had gear, cause we look like, we like to look good. Mm -hmm. I can say we like to look good. I'm not going to say everybody, but I know after wearing gang colors and all of that, we we got to a place where we wanted to dress nice. So Delancey Street was a big place for us. The hats, coats, everything. You got some money, you went down to D Street. Can you please talk to us about your decision to join the military? Okay, so back when you were placed, they used to have this um, Sunday... The older guys in the neighborhood, they had this thing called um, Sunday afternoon fights. So what happened was a lot of guys used to go into the building. We had a, we had a guy on uh, the 161st Street, his name was Wesley, and he used to sponsor these fights. 
and they used to bet on guys. So I used to go make money fighting in the building on Sunday, challenging whoever came. And uh, I guess that was kind of like when the time I kind of transitioned because I was always kind of, like I said, I didn't want to fight at first, but then people kept pushing me to fight, pushing to fight. So I, I just became normal fighting, became a normal part of my life. So it just kind of brought the violence out of me where I was just, I was just a violent person back then. I became violent. I wasn't violent at first. At first I didn't want to fight, but after getting into so many fights and so many people antagonizing me to fight, I just became violent and now I wanted to fight. So I started out with the fights and um, ultimately I was challenged, well, if you're such a tough guy, why don't you get in the boxing ring and challenge yourself to see if you're really as good as you think you are. So I thought, that sounds reasonable to me. So I first went to college. I went up to Brockport State and I joined their boxing team. So I was boxing in college, but I guess the problem was trying to take care of myself and go to college at the same time because I'm still broke. You know, I didn't have anybody helping me in college. So trying to box, work full time, and go to college full time wasn't that simple. So I thought to myself, well, I knew my own, my own skill sets and capabilities. I knew I was very talented as a fighter. So I knew that if I joined the military, there was no way they were gonna make me wear a uniform because I was too good with my hands. I knew that. So I was like, okay, if I join the military, I'll get on their boxing team and I'll just fight, I'll box. And I did, I joined the military. It's the day I got out of basic training, as soon as I graduated basic training in AIT, I went straight to the gym. I tried for the boxing team. They put me with the toughest guy in the gym. I knocked them out in the first round. And from then on, I was the captain of the boxing team. And I never saw a uniform after that. So part of my reason for joining the military is because I knew I could box because I wanted to fight. And even if I, I, even if I didn't fight, I knew I could still be doing something I liked, which I liked the violence back then. I used to like the violence. So I said, okay, even if I don't box, I can always go to war and I'll still have fun. Because like I said, the neighborhood we grew up in that's all we did was violence. So I was like, okay, I can be getting paid for violence. Mm -hmm. So a lot of reason why I joined the military was because I enjoyed the violence back then. I was addicted to the violence. So I said, I'm either gonna box or I'm gonna go overseas and fight. Because back then we had hostages in Iran. And I thought I wanted to go to Iran and fight. Right. So a lot of reason for me joining the military, I just wanted to fight. Got it. Now you said AIT which is advanced initial training where you get your military occupation or specialty. Exactly. What MOS. was your MOS? So my, my um, MOS was 16 Echo, which is air defense artillery. Um, I think it's a different type of missile system they make now, but that back then it was called Hawkfire control missiles, which my job basically was to, it was, it was, looking at a screen and seeing aircraft miles away and shooting them down from miles away. So it was like Patriot missiles type of situation, but it right. wasn't called Patriot missiles back then in the eighties when I was in the military, it was a different name for it, which was uh, Hawk fire control uh, missiles. I remember that. Yeah. Great. Can you tell us about the duty stations that you went to? Well, once I made the boxing team, they kept me at Fort Bliss because that's where the boxing was. The boxing was three places. It was in Fort Bliss, it was in Fort Bragg, and it was in Fort Campbell. I mean, Fort Hood had a team, but I'm talking about the three major places in the Army at that time. It was Fort Bliss, Fort Campbell, and Fort Bragg. So I was at Fort Bliss. Nice. Nice. El Paso, Texas. El Paso, Texas. That's right. Can, can you talk to us about uh, some of your teammates on the boxing team? I know Tyrell Biggs, and I don't want to call out any extra names. I'll let you do it. Well, the, I, I was on a lot of teams. So my, my first team was a college team 
my my first military team um for let me say first of all the army we had some of the top rated, rated fighters in, in the world on the army team. We had guys that were ranked, Joe Lewis Manley, he was ranked number one as a, as a lightweight. We had um, we had a lot of guys. There was a guy in Fort Kimmel, Kentucky. I can't remember his name, but he was ranked number four as a middleweight in the country. I was ranked number six as a light heavyweight in the country. Um, that was the military team. Mm -hmm. So, I, I I won the Golden Gloves. I won the regionals. So I qualified to fight in the nationals, is which I started meeting all the big names. Okay, so in the nationals, I, I fought the um, California State Golden Glove champ. I knocked him out in the first round. So that got me to the next level where I fought the guy that was ranked number one in the country at the time. And I lost to him, but... <clears throat> It was a close fight. I knocked him down the first round. He knocked me down the third round, but he got the decision. So, but they, you know, were impressed with me. So I got elected for the team because you can't get on the team. They got to pick you for the team. So I got selected. Now, <clears throat> being in the military, the military, and you understand this because you're in the military, they wrote me TDY orders allowing me to travel with whatever team I made. So I was on a couple of teams. I was on a regional team. They let me travel with the regional team. I was on the United States team. They let me travel with the United States team. That's one of the benefits of being in the military and on the boxing team at the same time. They just write you TDY. They didn't give me per diem pay. So <laughs> you had your per diem pay. You got your TDY pay. And I, and I got to travel all over the world. You know, on one trip, the first trip I made with the United States team, <clears throat> I, we went to uh, England first. And then from England, we went to Germany. From Germany, we went to Poland. From Poland, we went to Switzerland. Then back to New York, then back to Texas. Wow. You know, and Terrell Biggs was my roommate at the time. They called him Silly Philly and Carl the Truth Williams. I don't know if you heard of him. Mm -hmm. He was me, me, him, and Terrell. That's, those were my hangout partners at Olympic camp. And this was before Tyson. Actually, when I left the team, Evander Holyfield took my place. When Terrell left the team, Mike Tyson took his place. So they were a generation after us. But the team before us, what happened was, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was a team that was before us the entire team got killed in a plane crash going to Poland. The plane crashed into a wall. This is 1979. The plane crashed into a wall, killed the whole team. That's why we were selected for a new team because the whole team was wiped out. So we were actually the first team to go to Poland after the team got killed. Can you talk to us about any titles that you held and you won in the military? In boxing, you mean? In boxing, yes. Oh. Okay, so I was the 1977 all-college light heavyweight champion. The 1980 Fort Bliss Invitational light heavyweight champion. The 1981 Board Association light heavyweight champion. The 1981 Region 14 light heavyweight champion. The 1981 Silver... Um, uh, international Games silver medalist. I won a bronze medal in Poland. And um, I noticed something I'm forgetting. Um, there's something else I just can't. I noticed something else. I know I'm missing something, but that's that's basically it. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, do you mind telling us uh, what military awards and ranks that you achieved? Okay, so I achieved a lot of ranks in the military, but I wasn't a good soldier. And what I mean by that is I got in trouble a lot. I wasn't what you would call a ragbag because I was one of the best trained soldiers you can find. In fact, I led the battery run. Whenever you had a run, I always carried the flag because they knew I would never get tired. Right. But my problem was getting girls caught in the barracks. That's how I get, I got, I used to get Article 15s. You know what that is. Right. Because 
I was a womanizer. I love women. So, you know, you're not supposed to have women in your barracks. And I had women in my barracks every day. I didn't get caught every day, but you know, being in the military, you know what a CQ is. Yes, sir. So the CQ comes around at night and checks the doors of the barracks to make sure every, you know, just to make sure everything's copacetic. And your door is supposed to be locked. But for some reason, I just forget to lock the door. So every time I got a, every time I got an Article 15, because, you know, they take your pay and they take your rank, but they couldn't do anything else to me because I was special duty boxing team. And the general was like, no, he's going to fight. So, because they wanted to give me extra duty and put me on KP and all this other stuff, but they couldn't punish me, but they kept taking my rank away. So with all the extreme, because the thing about the army was they said, okay, listen, we'll let you go TDY and travel as much as you want. As long as you don't say anything neg negative in your interviews about the military. That's the only thing they made sure about me and I agreed to that. So anytime they interview me for a newspaper or, or in television, which happened a lot, I always spoke good about the military. But like I said, getting caught with women in barracks, I couldn't, I couldn't keep my promotions. Right. So they kept that part of me in check, but they still let me do what I want to do. So it was like a trade-off. We're not going to give you the rank, but you can still travel because you're making, you know, you're making good statements about the military, which I did. Because I, I did appreciate... First of all, I appreciate them letting me travel. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that they didn't make me wear a uniform. I appreciate that they let me live my life. You know, they didn't, I didn't have a, I never had a roommate. I had a barracks without a roommate. If they had an inspection, my room was never inspected. So I knew I was living large within the military. So I didn't mind the articles, but like I said, I was just, I love women. And, I, and then you couldn't have one in the room. I wasn't going to pay for a hotel and bring them to the room. So that was my downfall, the women. <laughs> How long were you in the military? Two years. Two years? Great. How did that, how did that military experience impact you as, as a life experience? It still impacts, it impacts me as a life experience because the discipline I learned in the military, I carry with me throughout my life. You know, I still get up at sunrise to this day. You know, I still work out to this day. I still train my body to this day. I still have the discipline in whatever I do to this day because of the military. So I'm very grateful that I did join the military because without the military, because before the military, I was a good fighter, but it takes discipline to win. Mm -hmm. You know, being a good fighter and winning fights is not the same thing. Right. You can be skilled at anything. It doesn't mean you're gonna win in life. You need discipline to win anything or gain anything in life. So I appreciate the drill sergeants that taught me discipline, that taught me how to push beyond the limits of my own mind to say, no, you can do that. And I, and I installed that in my own kids. Well, my kids are very, they're the same way. When they put their mind to something, they get it done. Mm -hmm. And I blame the military for that in my life to where to this day. If I put my mind to something, it's going to be done. I don't care how long it takes, how hard it is to do. It's, going to, it's just the way I think. No, this can be done, and I'm going to finish it. So I, I, I'm grateful to the military for the discipline. Awesome. Have any of your children picked up that military bug, follow behind in your shoes? They do have that kind of discipline. They don't like the military. And one thing I taught my kids at very young, I told them, you know, because I made a living most of my life with my physical strength. And what I explained to my kids is you can make more money with your mind. So I started teaching my kids how to build computers when they were five years old. Because I, I used to build and repair computers. So I taught them that skill at five years old. And today all my kids have bachelor degrees in computer science or computer engineering. All of them. And they all have great jobs writing computer code right now. Awesome. Can you talk to us about, did, did you follow that in a professional career, computers, IT? Well, that's an interesting story too. It wasn't something I was doing professionally, but what happened was when my kids were young, they used to always break the computers. Mm -hmm. So I used to always wind up taking the computer to the shop to, to get it fixed. And I used to watch them fix it so I knew how to fix it. So ultimately I became friends 
with the guy in the computer store who actually taught me how to fix and repair computers. So whenever I learned, I taught to my kids so they could also know just so I wouldn't have to do it mm -hmm. because they were always breaking the computers. So I said, okay, you break it, you fix it. So they know how to fix it. And my, my actually one of my sons got through college repairing the other kids' computers in, in school. Okay. So where do you live now? Where are you from, if you don't mind sharing that? Yeah, I live in Buffalo, New York. So I, I bought a house up there uh, 20, 20 years ago. I bought a house up there. And I still had an apartment in the city, but that's my primary residence. I don't have an apartment in the city now, but that's my primary residence. Are you currently back in the art scene? Can you update us on what your current projects are, if any? <coughs> well, I didn't have any projects in New York City, but I think I do now. Um, there's a there's an organization called uh, Black Benji Vive. Um, Black Benji was killed in 1971, trying to make peace between gangs that were fighting. So um, there's some high school kids who actually have worked to get a street named after Black Benji. Actually, June 2nd, the street is going to be officially named after Black Benji, 165th and Rogers Place. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with this organization because I felt like, okay, these guys really got the heart of what we were trying to do with the movie Rebel Kings. They understood the message. Because if you ask, they asked me, okay, what was Rebel Kings about? I said, Rebel Kings was about a mother named Gwendolyn who didn't want to see other kids die like her son. So she told a gang leader, Charlie, my son died for peace. That's what Rebel Kings is about to me. And they caught that message. So they go from high school to high school, spreading the message of peace to guys that might be violent and in gangs and wanting to kill each other, just trying to do if they can save one, which I think is important work. So I told them that I would definitely help them in their endeavors to make that message heard. Right, and I see you're repping the Rebel Kings That's right it. now. Yeah. You know, can you talk to us a little about that? So Rebel Kings and, you know, people, Rebel Kings came out in two, officially came out in 210. Uh, it didn't really get into the screen until 214. It didn't get to 42nd Street until 215. And the main reason why Rebel Kings didn't get out is because when we took it, we took it to a lot of people trying to get them to help us release it. They did not want to hear a message about peace. You know, most stuff that's sold today is about sex and violence. Mm -hmm. So when they saw Rebel Kings was a movie about a peace treaty, a peace initiative, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want that message. You, they always talk about gun violence and all sorts of gun violence. We give them a, a viable solution. No, we don't want it. Do you really want to solve the problem? Because we're not talking about politicians solving problems. We're talking about kids solving their own problems. And that's what we, we was trying to teach kids. Because originally, Rebel Kings was never supposed to be a movie. The original point of Rebel Kings was, was supposed to be a video. We were making a video for at-risk youth in New York City. Robert De Niro has an um, organization uh, where he deals with at-risk youth. So Robert De Niro was the first one that took our video and showed it to his at-risk youth who loved the movie. And then an, an actor, director, Jim Carrey, wanted to get involved. Mm -hmm. And Jim Carrey is the one that actually helped us to get Rebel Kings into the theaters. So it became this big deal because it wasn't really, like I said, originally it was just a video we were doing for at-risk youth, trying to stop kids from killing each other. That's all we were really trying to do. And that's all really we're trying to do now, still pushing the message. And Black Benji v Vive, they got that message. We're just trying to, we don't, we don't have a complicated agenda here. We just want to see young kids stop killing each other. That's all we asked for. And they got that out of the movie. So they have taken that baton, so to speak, and they go from high school to high school talking to kids about youth violence. And I told them I would help them with that. So that's what I'm currently working on, helping them push their message of uh, peace from within themselves, not some politicians promising some legislation or changing some law. Just some kids saying, you know what, 
I'm not going to kill you because, you know, I don't want to go to jail and you're worth more than me taking your life, you know. And first of all, they have to think of themselves and their own self-worth to where a lot of kids today, like, like me and a lot of kids when we were young, we didn't have hope. So death, jail, mean nothing to us. Mm-hmm. We figured we're going to die anyway. We can die in jail. We don't care. You can shoot us. We, just got, we got nothing to live for. So, you know, giving kids hope that there's a future for them, you know, that's part of the solution right there. Because if they think there's hope, then they're not going to go out doing stuff they know is going to end their life, whether it be, you know, shooting somebody or whether it be, you know, well, I don't care if I go to jail or I don't care if I die. I don't have nothing to live for anyway. Right. And so they become hopeless. You know, Rebel Kings gives them hope because they see guys like them who were also hopeless at one point that was able to, you know, at least give it another day to say, okay, maybe tomorrow it can be better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a senior citizen now. Never thought I would be 15. I never, honestly, I never thought I would make it to be 15 years old. And when I made it to be 18, I was amazed. I, wow, I'm 18? And now I'm like, wow, I'm 65. I, I mean, it's amazing to me. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I look at kids and I see a lot of hopelessness in their faces, just like I had hopelessness in my face where I didn't care if I lived or died. It didn't matter to me. I was just waiting for my turn to die. You know, so many guys in our neighborhood was getting killed. I just waited for my turn. I just thought it was going to be eventual. So, yeah, seeing the kids have hope now and seeing Rebel Kings where it gives them hope, that's something to me that's worth fighting for. So who, who, who else was involved in Rebel Kings with you, and what were their roles? Uh, the main guys were Karate Charlie, who was uh, Ghetto Brothers, Yellow Benji, who was also Ghetto Brothers, and uh, Blackie, the president of the Savage Skulls. At least those were the main guys. I say main guys because... These were the guys that lived in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And these are the guys who's, I should say, these are the voices you heard. Because, you know, there's a lot of guys around. But there's always, always main voices, at least in our neighborhood, that you heard. Karate Charlie, Yellow Benji, Blackie from the Savage Skulls. There were other guys, but these are like the main three names, at least the hierarchy of our neighborhood in terms of gangs. Mm-hmm. There were other gangs and other guys. But I'm just saying, in terms of what we recognize in our neighborhood, these were the main three. I mean, were guys uptown like Bam Bam from the Black Spades. That was a name. But like I said, that was uptown. And I didn't live uptown. But I respected and I was with them. Mm-hmm. But like I said, the main thing for me was the South Bronx. And I'm from the South Bronx. I'm not from Bronx River. I'm not from Castle Hill. I was from Fort Apache. So no matter who I associate myself with, I'm a Fort Apache guy. So these are the names that I respected. So these are the guys that got together and decided, okay, we're going to do this video to, to maybe prevent some other kids from killing each other. And that's the guys that got involved. You know, the director, Shan Nicholson, and like I said, uh, the actor Jim Carrey got involved. He became one of the producers and a great help because he was the one that actually got us a, a door a door open for us because we couldn't get the door open on our own because it wasn't sex and violence. But Jim had enough pull to, you know, make some calls and get it through. So we finally got it premiered on 42nd. 40, on okay. Is it playing now? Well, it's on Amazon now. It's playing on Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. So it can, you can still watch it. Yeah. All right. What does writing mean to you? To me, writing was... making a statement, you know, um, your name kind of was, became your identity, like, um, I'll say the name Topaz. When I think of Topaz, Topaz is more than a name. For me, Topaz was always an identity. Like, if I introduce myself to somebody, they say, yo, what's your name? And I'll say, okay, my name is Murph most of the time. It just depends on who I'm talking to. But if I say to you, my name is Topaz, it's either because I'm doing something like this or you did something I don't like. And that part of me is going to come out on you. So it just depends. Like, 
But Topaz to me is more, it's more than a name. It's kind of like a personality. You know, I was doing some speaking up, up, upstate and the, the, um, you know, last year we had a mass shooting. Right. So they asked me to speak because of the mass shooting. So I told the chick that asked me to speak, I said, well, make sure you identify me as Topaz because that's the one that's going to speak. Lloyd Murphy's not going to speak. And she put on the fly at Topaz and I told her, I said, I don't like that. She said, well, I'm going to put Lloyd Murphy down whether you like it or not. So I wouldn't speak for her anymore because she, she doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. I said, you don't understand Topaz. You're disrespecting my name. Lloyd Murphy doesn't speak to people. I said, Topaz is the one that did all of this stuff. So when I look at Lloyd Murphy, I look at the military guy or my, my boxing name, which was Lightning Murphy because I had really fast hands. That's a different name for a different identity of me. Lloyd Murphy is a professional. Topaz is whatever, you know, he's, he's the guy that you don't want to get him angry, you know, because he's a different entity, you know, he's the guy, but he's also the guy that's going to talk to the kids because the kids, they need to hear a nonviolent statement from somebody that knows about violence. I explained to them, like I said, when I started out young, I was afraid. I said, but the fear didn't last. After a while, you got used to it, the violence, I mean. So you became kind of numb to it. But there was another level after that. You started to enjoy it. At least I started to enjoy it. There's another level after that. You become addicted to it. You know, I needed to do something violent just to sleep at night at one point in my life. So there was levels of violence. Now, like I said in the movie, when you got guys that are violent, talking about peace, that's powerful. So if anybody could talk about peace, they talk about peace because they're scared. They scared to be they scared to be violent. So nobody's gonna listen to them. Because you're not really you don't really want peace. You're just scared of war. But you get a guy that actually loves war talking about peace, that's where the real power comes from. Because kids don't want, you know, kids can recognize your fake a mile away. Guys don't realize that. They want to speak to kids. Kids recognize fake in a second. So you start talking to them about peace and you never know war. What do you know about peace? So they want to know, they want to hear from somebody that's been in their shoes, that know what it's like to be angry enough to kill, or know what it's like to be addicted to violence. Because a lot of them out there, they're addicted to violence. You know, I tell the guys I'll say, I say, you know, in the Bronx, we had thrill killers. I mean, I grew up with guys, they'll kill you just to see which way you fall. I mean, just psychos. I said, upstate, they don't have that. They have guys that they get angry, not even want to shoot somebody. No, these guys weren't angry with you. They did it as a joke. You know, I know guys walking down the street. We walking down the street one day, I won't mention names, but a friend of mine shot a friend of mine in the foot because he said, I don't like the way you're walking. And he wasn't trying to kill him. He just didn't like where he was walking, so he shot him in the foot. And we thought it was a big joke. And he said, you better not scream. He said, you better not scream. And the guy closed his mouth. And he said, okay, call an ambulance. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way things were. So violence was just a normal part of our existence growing up. But, you know, Benji, Charlie, these guys that organized a peace treaty, they did the right thing. I didn't want peace because for me personally, when Black Benji got killed, that was a turning point for me because I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want the violence. I didn't like the violence, but when they killed Black Benji, that kind of made me violent because I was like, okay, this guy was trying to make peace and they killed him. Now that's something worth fighting for. So the first time there was actually a rumble, I was willing to participate in because I thought it was a good cause, but it was a rumble that never happened. And making the peace treaty was the right thing to do because it saved a lot of lives. Probably mine, because I was a young knucklehead. I didn't know any better anyway. I would have did it just because everybody else did it. But it probably saved my life. And if I can save some other kid's life, then I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile too. That's why when they asked me to speak about peace, I'm willing to speak about peace because I know I might be saving somebody's life just like somebody saved mine, just by my words. So I think it's a good thing. All right. Wow. Wow. 
how has your understanding of the writing culture changed over time in your opinion? Well, um, I'll talk about hip hop because people say different things about hip hop and writing because some guys say, oh, graffiti is its own thing. It's not hip hop, but they don't understand hip hop because it's not a problem with writing. It's a problem with hip hop. The heart behind writing and the spirit behind writing is the same spirit behind DJing and breakdancing and MCing. It's the same spirit. And they don't understand that because they're not of their spirit. So to guys that say that, I don't argue with them because they're right in their own perspective. Hip hop, graffiti is not hip hop to them. I agree with you, brother. You're entitled to your own opinion, especially if you're a pioneer. A lot of pioneers say, oh no, graffiti is its own thing. God bless you, brother. But to me, graffiti is the first element of hip hop. Not because of the styles or no, it's because of the spirit behind why was it done. The same reason that we wrote on trains is the same reason why somebody picked up a microphone and say, everybody in the house say ho, it's the same thing. The same thing with the break dancing. We were all trying to find our way out of the poverty, out of the stress, out of the anger, out of the thing that we were doing before into this new thing which liberated into us in finding our own self-worth. That's what it was to us. Now, when the first record, Rapper's Delight, came out, I heard it on the radio, I said they sold our culture. Because I knew, as soon as they made it into a commodity, it had to change. Because now you have people with a lot of money controlling it to say, this is what hip hop is. Now today they got hip hop ads, and hip hop this, and hip hop that. Who the hell invented that stuff? I'll tell you who invented it. Marketing strategy. It's marketing strategy. You can't tell me, you talk to Ben Body. Nobody was trying to make a multi-billion dollar industry out of hip hop. Nobody had that idea. Not a graffiti, not a rapper, not a DJ, not a break dancer. Nobody was saying, we're going to make a billion dollar industry here. Nobody was saying that. They were saying the same thing the writer was saying. We want to take what we have inside of us, whatever skill, whatever talent, whatever ability, and we're going to use that to make ourselves known. And we didn't care about being known in California. To us, the South Bronx was our own world. If you were known in the South Bronx, that was good enough. But we decided to take over the planet. Initially, like I said, the mass transit system. But we didn't, like I said, I didn't, I didn't care about being known in the world. I wanted to be known in the South Bronx, Topaz, South Bronx. As long as the South Bronx knew me, I was happy. I was a star as far as I was concerned. Now, if anybody else knew me outside of the South Bronx, even to this day, you know, I speak a lot of places. I don't really care. And I tell them, I tell the crowds, listen, hip hop is from the Bronx. You know, I try to talk to you people. You don't want to hear me. That's fine. I said, but when I come to the Bronx and I talk to kids, my heart is in the Bronx, you know, they said, well, aren't you scared coming back to the Bronx at this age? I said, scared? I, I'm just me, man. I'm, I'm, the, I'm a soldier. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. That's my mindset. So if you want to bring the noise, I guess we're going to have to dance. But the Bronx is my home. And as, as crazy as it is, I'm still proud of the Bronx. And there's a lot of good stuff here. And I tell the kids everywhere I go, I say, you know, hip hop was created by teenagers. And you guys can create something bigger than hip hop if you want to. You just gotta think about it. They can do it. I don't even think about it, but I tell, I challenge them to think about it. Because 40 years later, if I won't be here, but hopefully they will have created something that 40 years later will become a multi multi billion dollar industry. Because the Bronx is about creating stuff. We don't follow, we don't follow nobody. The Bronx. We don't follow any trends in the Bronx. We create them and we make other people follow us. That's what I love about the Bronx. Awesome. And that leads me to that question. We always like to end our oral histories with this one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? Well, I think the most important thing right now, because the Bronx means a lot of things to me, besides it being home, the Bronx created hip-hop culture. And that's very important for people to know. 
Because like I said, we get a lot of phonies out there trying to say, you know, they're building a, a hip hop museum or whatever, and you get a lot of people involved in this hip hop museum, and they really kind of rating themselves based on their popularity or how many records they sold. That, I mean, that might mean something to people, but I don't mean nothing to me. When I think about hip hop, I think about Cool Herc, I think about Pete DJ Jones, I think about DJ Hollywood, I think about, you know, Baron, you know, I think about the guys from the neighborhood, Flash, you know, AJ, you know, I mean, I think about the guys from the neighborhood. I don't think about any names outside of the Bronx when I think about hip hop. Now, other guys came along, mind you, but to me, hip hop was birthed in the Bronx, period. Whatever came later, came later from wherever else, fine. We give them their dues. But the thing that we call hip hop, including the person, no bug Starsky, who made the phrase hip hop famous, because they said Cowboy created it, but Starsky made it famous. I know because I was there. We had a Burger King on Prospect Avenue on 161st Street. Lovebug Starsky was the DJ there. That was the first time I heard the term hip hop. So that's where I know the word hip hop came from. So he was a teenager that says something out of his mouth that today is the number one selling music form in the planet Earth from the Bronx. So like I said, the first mural that was done on a subway car, you see murals on buildings in Buffalo, they doing murals on buildings. In fact, I teach my kids how to do murals. I let them do practice on the garage. I, I, I white paint my garage and I let my daughter practice doing murals because it's big business right now. Mm -hmm. This man over here started doing murals first. Who's that man? Staff 161. So I don't care what they say, because I was there. I'm not making stuff up. I'm just telling you what happened, what I know. That mural began train murals. From train murals began these murals that you see on the walls. They got the idea from murals that were first done on a New York City subway platform. So like I said, we created wealth for people. Not that we ourselves became wealthy, but we did create something for other people to become wealthy. So even that, when I see people, all I can think of, they should be thanking me. They don't know that I'm the reason why they're doing what they're doing. But like I said, if one person did it, then it wouldn't have become a culture. Thousands of gang members, thousands of black kids, thousands of Puerto Rican kids, and white kids too, gravitated to what was being done. And that's why it became a culture. Thousands of kids in the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan and other boroughs, and it began to go to Jersey and Connecticut and all these other places in Philly and whatever, and today you have this worldwide movement that started with teenagers in the Bronx. So that makes me very proud. And it's hard to speak in other states and other cities because they don't want to hear about the Bronx. They want to hear about their own city. But I got to tell them the truth about the situation because I'm not trying to take away from their city. I'm just telling them what happened. This thing started in the Bronx. So just like we started something in 1970, I challenged kids in 2023 to start something else, not to follow what we did or to follow what whatever they're doing, but to birth something else from within their poverty like we did and create something great from their own creativity. That's what I challenge kids to do. Okay. You know, I, I want to follow up because uh, that, that was a great answer. Can you talk to us about your experiences at Casita? Casita Maria. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's Happy Sad at Casita Maria. It's, uh, you know, it's a place where, you know, I went to play basketball. It was one of the only centers around. You know, we were kids. And you needed to because most of the time we'd be outside playing basketball in the summertime outside. But when winter hit, you know, it's kind of hard to be outside playing basketball because your hands got cold. So Casita Maria was up on Simpson Street, down from the 41st Precinct. 
So we played basketball there, but that's where I met. Well, it wasn't Flash and the Furious Five then, mm -hmm. but guys like Melly Mel, Cowboy Flash, they all be shooting pool in the basement or playing basketball because it was just a community center. So that was the good part of it. And Flash kind of started playing music there, you know. And like I said, it wasn't this DJ Flash that everybody knows. It was just Flash from the neighborhood. Like I said, Melly Mel from the neighborhood. Just like I said, these old neighborhood guys. They weren't stars. They're just guys from the neighborhood, teenagers just like us, doing what they do. Um, the prop, and I stopped going to Casita Maria because one day I'm playing basketball, and this guy, you know, he's following me, following me, following me, and on purpose. So I'm like, you know, I'm a boxer. I'm not gonna let him keep it up. So finally, I was like, look, listen, we're gonna fight if you keep pushing me, you know, keep following me. So he pushes me. So we start fighting. And I mean, fighting was the easiest thing for me. So within like three minutes, you know, his eye is black, his nose is bleeding. But, you know, back then, you know, guys carry knives. So I just got a quarter field because, you know, there was a coat that was the style back then. It was called a quarter field. So I just got this quarter field. So now this guy goes to trying to stab me. So I'm running. He's chasing me around the gym trying to stab me. So I, um, I grab my coat. And I'm trying to prevent him from stabbing me. And this guy cut my, he cut my coat to shreds, you know, trying to stab me. So finally he gets tired and he's waiting for me outside. So for some, back then they didn't have any phone in the place. So there was no calling 911. It was just me and this guy waiting for me outside to stab me. Now I knew this, and he knew there's no way he could beat me with the hand. So he's going to stab me because he can't lose the fight. So he's waiting for me outside. So I stayed till like they were getting ready to close. Finally, I go outside. So he's waiting for me with his boys. She said, we're going to finish fighting. And I know he's going to stab me. So I'm like, listen, I don't want, boom, I'm gone. Because <laughs> one of the other things I could do was run. <laughs> so as soon as he started talking, I took off. And once I got, once I started, I knew there was no way he was going to catch me because I was fast. I was a fast runner. And he, he chased me for about three blocks, but I was gone. But I never went back to Casino Maria after that. But yeah, this is, once once he started talking, he gave me a chance to run. There was no way I was going to stay there because I knew I was going to get stabbed. I knew he was going to stab me, so I'm like, I'm I'm not going to get stabbed tonight. I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to get out of here. This guy can't beat me. There's no way he can beat me with his hands. So as soon as he started talking crap while he's talking. I I put it into fifth gear. I was gone. <laughs> right. But I couldn't go back to Casino Maria after that. I think the guy was in the Savage Skulls, but it was it was a Puerto Rican brother, but I, I don't remember it. He he wasn't wearing gang colors, but a knife is a knife. It don't matter if you're a gang or not. He wanted to stab me really bad because I embarrassed him in front of his crew. Oh, well, he shouldn't be fighting. Just it's just basketball. But yeah, I met Flash and the Furious Five there. They 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 be there all the time. I didn't know they lived down the block, but I found out later on that he lived down the block from Casino Maria, right near the Forty First Precinct. Right. Wow. Wow. Topaz One, this has been an awesome time documenting your, your history and graph. And here in the South Bronx, I want to thank you so much, you know, for taking time out of your busy schedule. You know, uh, what we like to do at the end of the oral histories is we like to ask all the writers if you, if you don't mind if you can write your tag for us so that we can add it to our entire collection for you. We sure. So, uh, there's some markers. There's one more over here. Oh. Standing here looking down on all them colors. Yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how it is. Yeah. All right, there it is.
something I was thinking about. I forgot what it was, though. Uh, but I never had been to that Casita Maria. I heard about it. It was like a, a boys' club or something right it there. Was, by it was Central a community Street. center. It was a, it was I've, a... I've never, I don't think I've heard of it. I've, I've heard of it, but I don't think I've ever been there. Yeah, Casita Maria was, um, it was just a neighborhood place. And they had the center there for a long time. Mm. They had the center there for a long time. Um, and like I said, I went there every day up until um, I had that beef. That incident happened, yeah. You know, I, you know, you finally find a place to go. Right, get off the street, go play pool, watch TV or something. I never understood, you know. Dude, we just playing basketball. Why did it have to be that? But you know, South Bronx, South Bronx, or whatever. Yeah. Maybe the guy had too many old emus. <laughs> back then, right? Old oh, Wasn't even 40s back then, just a court. Courts. Have a nigga blast. Also, wasn't Ola talking about that street signing or with the bomb Benji? She did. She did mention that. Right, right. Yeah, they got uh, June second is the um, right official release of the street. Right. So I've been, uh, I'm trying to help them get it together. But a lot of people are getting involved. That's that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And we're trying to get everybody, you know, to come down because, like I said, that's an important event in Bronx history, and it's not being taught. Well, it is being taught now, but it was never taught previously because nobody was talking about it. But the kids saw the movie Rubble Kings, so they 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 it really inspired them to do something because, you know, a lot of them deal with the same problems that we were dealing with, where they got violence in the neighborhoods, and they're hoping that somebody will come along and somebody, a savior, somebody yeah, yeah, help help us, please, you know. Yeah. Ooh. Did you show us the tag for the camera? For the camera. Hold it up. Oh, mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, finish up. Going into the archives. Could you hold it up for us? Topaz one. Thank you so peace. much, my man. Peace out. Peace. Thanks. Okay, so after joining the military, uh, the military allowed me to join other teams and to be able to travel with other teams. So during the, uh, the national, the United States National Boxing Champions, I, championships, I, I did really well. I, uh, I, I, I fought the uh, number one ranked guy in the country at the time. So I didn't win the fight, but I did really well in the fight. So I was selected for the team. So I, the uh, military allowed me to move to Colorado Springs where the training camp was. And uh, my roommate was a boxer named Terrell Biggs. Me, him, and another boxer named Carl Truth Williams. These, these, were, my, these were my best friends, Carl Truth. My best friends in the Olympic camp. So they began to send us out to fight uh, in a worldwide tournament. It was called USA versus the world at the time. So our first stop was uh, London, England, which I had never been to England before. But um, like I said, the military allowed me to go. So we flew to England. It was really, the only thing I really, really remember about England was really foggy. I remember trying to land and you couldn't see the runway. So I was kind of like scary, but excited at the same time. And we didn't stay there long. But from England, we went to uh, Frankfurt, Germany. So Frankfurt, we had a really nice hotel room. This was the best hotel room I ever stayed in that was overlooking the city, but we had a sunken living room and our suite. It was just fabulous. And we stayed there for two weeks. In fact, while we were there, the, the uh, restaurants that we ate at would close down the entire restaurant for the, for the, for the boxing team to come in and eat privately. So that was kind of cool. Then from Poland, we went to uh, Warsaw, Poland, okay. which back then in 1980, uh, and I should say 1981, but yeah, 1980 as well, it was still a communist country. Yeah. So being in a communist country, things were a little different. Getting, landing on the plane, uh, the plane, like in America, where the plane goes up to the terminal and you get out and all that, no, that's not what happened. The plane lands in the middle of the runway 
Then here comes a truck with uh, soldiers with automatic weapons to get us off of a, the plane and take us to our hotels. And I was like, okay, why are we having armed soldiers take us? But that's just the way it was. Yeah, yeah. So in Poland, it was a, a tournament called Felix Stam. Hmm. And Felix was a very uh, popular uh, national hero, I guess, at that time. Uh, there was another guy who was really popular. His name was Lech Walenza, mm -hmm. who I never met personally, but he was like a big deal at the time that we went in. He was fighting for the rights of the people. Yeah. So we came in really as ambassadors. So we were there with the uh, Polish team, the Cuban team, the Russian team, the American team. I think it was Czechoslovakia, the Czechs. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the other team. It could have been more, but those are the ones I remember offhand. So my first night fighting was against the number one ranked fighter in Poland. I don't remember his name. Uh, now, I was a pretty good fighter, but I the, in Europe, the boxing is a little different. These guys are really tough. So it kind of shocked me because his style was different from anything I ever fought before. So it was very confusing to me because he was maneuvering in a way that I didn't understand. So yeah. it was because I was a pretty good fighter, but I had a tough time with this guy. Yeah. But I, I didn't I didn't know if I won or lost. But during, you know, when the fight was over and they because it was all in Polish and I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> sure, sure. But at the end of the fight, they raised my hand. So I knew I won. Wow. So I was like, OK. But it was a rough fight, and I took a lot of lumps, and actually I had to sleep with an ice pack on my head. Ooh. Now, the thing about uh, amateur boxing is, you know, in a tournament like that, you fight every day. It's not like you fight and then six months later. So my next fight was the next day at 2 o'clock. This was 7 p.m. at night. Yeah. So my next fight was the next day. It was at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So I was still recovering from the times getting punched in my head from the first fight. Yeah. So it made it rough, and I don't think the guy was as good as the first guy I fought. Nevertheless, I did lose a decision, but for my efforts, I did manage to bring back the bronze medal. Wow. So that was kind of cool for me, that you know, is. to come back to America with a bronze medal to show for it. Yeah. So we left Poland, and from Poland, we went to Switzerland. And I didn't, we didn't have any fights in Switzerland, but it was great to see that country. I've never seen a more beautiful place than Switzerland in terms of the mountains and the greenery. It was just amazing, mm. you know, landing in Switzerland and looking at all of this uh, scenery. And then it was uh, back to New York and then, oh, wait, let me just say this. I broke my hand. I forgot to mention this. I broke my hand in the first fight in Poland. <laughs> so my second fight, I was fighting with a broken right hand. So... I came back to Texas and I was scheduled to fight again in Texas, which I did with the broken hand and I won. But after that, I finally went to the hospital and got a cast put on my hand. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was my boxing. So let me move on to something I think should be talked about, which is hip hop and what I what I see about hip hop because I get a lot of questions when I speak, especially because of the movie Rubble Kings. But there's a lot of things that they edited out of Rubble Kings that. I said in Rubble King, but they didn't put it in the film. But I'll say it here because this is historical ar archives. So in the, I think it was the, the, the 40s that the, there was a movement in New York called the Beatnik Movement. I don't, I'm not exactly sure when it started. I just know it was still around the 60s when I was growing up. Yeah. But it was called the Beatnik move, Movement. And these guys wore berets. And basically they were... Uh, Poetry, there was a lot of things in their, uh, their movement. It was poetry, there was song, and mainly it was bongo and spoken word. Now, we were being influenced by this, and maybe you guys don't remember this, but I do remember the beatniks, because the beatnik really turned into the hippie movement, and both movements had music. And, it was, and the cool thing about it, it was a colorless movement. There was no black or white. It was just, you're a beatnik or you're a hippie. So... They use words like, oh, cool, man, or, yeah, I'm hip, I'm hip. Yeah, he's really hip. Those are just the words we used back then. Yeah. So for me, hip-hop was like just a, a jump on that where we're just being hip because this is the cool thing to do. The cool thing to do was to have bongo music and have a, a word come up, poetry, 
rhyming on top of the bongo music, which is what we heard a group called the Last Poets do. Now, the Last Poets, who came out in the 60s, actually one of the per person from Rebel Kings uh, was in the Last Poets. So the Last Poets came out with an album in the 60s that influenced our neighborhood deeply. Everybody played that that album by the Last Poets, where they, on top of bongo music, had spoken word. Yeah, that really influenced us toward what they called rap, because even that we called it a rap session. Yeah, sure. So rap music evolved from that, because we first of all we call it chanting. We call it chanting, and chanting was something you did like in the military, but the gangs also chanted. Like before Rumble, we would chant just like the military chants. If you're in the basic chanting, one, two, three, four, you know, this type of stuff is called chanting. So that's something we did. So both of those put together all in the same pot started our culture. Yeah. The beatnik culture, the hippie culture where they would spray paint their vans with all kind of beautiful designs. And they would change their names because part of the beatnik movement, you, when you when you became part of the movement, you changed your name to something that was cool. Yeah. Just like I became Topaz. You know, it was something cool. It was kind of like having a alter identity almost. Sure. So this guy who was called Dub, really, now became Topaz. So he, and Topaz kind of became another personality. So it was my writing name, which my writing craft was a different personality. Yeah. My, my government name was my school name. But my street name was Topaz, which was something different. And guys in hip hop did the same thing, you know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Melly Mel, you know, everybody had these monikers or these names that we created for ourselves yeah. or somebody gave to us where we became a whole different identity. You know, Clyde became Cool Herc, That's a right. graffiti artist That's right. at first. So like I said, there were cultures and that, you know, that came before us that made us what we were. And, and like I said, rap music, it wouldn't be rap music to me without the last poets. Yeah, yeah. You know, the last poets basically formed our thinking about bongo beats and spoken word. Yeah. So this is what highly influenced us in those days. And like I said, with the hippie movement, it was just popular to have these votes, these old Volkswagen buses. And generally they would have a big multicolored peace sign on the side of the bus. Yeah. And they were preaching because this is the 60s, they're preaching, make love, not war. Stop fighting, stop killing, make love, not war. So this also influenced the gangs as well. Sure. Specifically the Ghetto Brothers. Sure. Because they were, they had a band. So they were moved a lot by the hippie movement as well. That's right. So all of this was, you know, we heard, we were, we were violent, but we, keep, we kept hearing, make love, not war. So we were influenced like by that which I believe also influenced the signing of the peace treaty in 1971. Absolutely. These factors, you know, like I said, you're, you're at war, but in the back of your mind, you're hearing the hippies say, make love, not war. And like I said, they're playing music and they're doing drugs and they're writing and they're changing their names and they're writing on buses and you see their names going by on the buses and we says, and we're looking at it and we think we're inventing something, but really we're just copying off of what they did because this is all part of our culture. And it was a beautiful thing because it was a peaceful movement it was a multicultural movement. It was no black or white. You know, people really didn't see color in those days. You know, if you ever look at the old uh, films of Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have thousands and thousands of people in this field listening to music without any violence. You know, it's a colorless movement. People yeah. just want to, you know, make love, not war. So all of this is, to me, the birth of hip-hop culture. Now... This is hip hop I'm talking about from the 70s. Now, whatever it has become since then, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm just telling my story in terms of what I saw as a child growing up in the South Bronx and what influenced me, specifically Soul Train with Don Cornelius, 
who came on in 68, I think 68 or 69, and, and there wasn't a lot of black programming, programming sure. on back then. So Soul Train is all we had to look forward to. Yeah. So on Saturdays at 11 o'clock, you're glued to that TV to find the next dance. Yeah. So we watched Soul Train and we watched, they always came out with another dance every week. And we would emulate their dances, but we would add something to it. And it came to a point where we called something breaking. Breaking was like you were dancing with somebody, but you would basically get down on the floor somehow. You would land up on the floor, and that was called breaking down. Yeah. And that's how break dancing, be, you know, became a thing. But like I said, it all evolved in the 60s movement of the beatneck movement and the hippie movement and the gang movement. This all melded into one little thing became a beautiful thing called hip hop. Because I, like I said, I don't know what hip hop is today, but I know when hip hop was created, it was the most beautiful thing we ever saw. Yeah. And it, it can be beautiful today. And you know, when I talk to the kids, I tell them, I says, you know, you guys don't have to follow what somebody else is doing. You can make your own thing. You're from the Bronx. The Bronx creates things. So you guys at any time you want to, and don't let anybody tell you you're too young. You're never young enough to create something amazing. So I always tell them, I said, listen, take your talents, take your skill sets, and just create something. We didn't know we were creating anything. We didn't know we were creating a multi-billion dollar, was, it really is a multi-billion dollar worldwide, you know, business at this time. Yeah. But we were just having fun. We were just trying to make the community better. We were just really just using what we had because we didn't have a lot of money or a lot of whatever, a lot of chances. We didn't. There was no record label to go to. Yeah. We were just having fun in our communities. Yeah. And it was pure. And it was necessary. It was a vital part of our community back then. And I think somehow, some way, it could be that way again. And when you were recording your uh, the main part of your oral history yesterday, you talked some about what, what writing meant to you and I thought that was a really uh, a really amazing part of your oral history um, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your thoughts on you know the old meaning of, of rapping what rap sessions like what, what's going on with rapping and rap sessions what, okay, what so, was going on there so the thing about rap rap in terms of what we understood back then a rap session was like okay, the Black Panthers or the Young Lords, you think about these organizations. So they had rap sessions. And a rap session would be basically you and a group of other people like-minded or not like-minded, but anyway, you go, you would have a bunch of guys or guys and girls get together and basically dialogue yeah. with one another. It could be a dialogue about certain, and a lot of it was social issues because even the beatnecks, it, it was, these were all social movements. Mm -hmm. You know, so... They were dialect about issues and problems in the neighborhood. You know, when you think about the last poets, that's what it was. It was a dialogue. Oh my God, people aren't gonna like this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It was a dialogue for black self-correction. And people don't wanna hear that, but I'm gonna say it because that's what it was. It was them dialoguing about, yeah, we got a lot of problems. We got a lot of racism. We got a lot of stuff holding us down, but it was about us not holding ourselves down which tapped into the gang violence where you're killing your brother man yeah. in the neighborhood. You're destroying your own neighborhood. So the last poet spoke to that because people, like I said, they don't like to hear that today about self-correction. But mainly dialogue could be about, well, the white man is doing this or the politicians do that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but with the last poets and, and most of the stuff on their music was about us, what we did to each other. Yeah, yeah and our own stupidity that kept us beneath what we were supposed to be in this land. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, it was a self-awareness dialogue that the last pause brought forth. And like I said, not that there's not issues that need to be addressed in terms of what politicians are doing. Sure. But I'm just saying, you can't just have that alone. Yeah. You need the self-correction too. You need both. Yeah. You need them to do the right thing, but if, you, if you're not doing the right thing, then it's just a handout. Yeah. And if you don't have the correction, then you're going to keep, you're going to stay in the hole. Yeah. 
because there's the persecution part of it, but then there's the stuff that you do to screw yourself up. Yeah. So that was about dialogue, you know, sitting down and having real conversations about what's really going on here. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that the community could come together and have a dialogue about, okay, what do we need to do about that? In fact, let me, let me kind of sidestep into snitching. And I know people want to talk about snitching, but I'm going to talk about 60s snitching and what we consider snitching. Yeah, yeah. Now, gang ruled the neighborhood. So we didn't need the police. We had the gang. Right. There was some kind of problem in the neighborhood. You talked to the gang leader. He sent the warlord out or a representative, and they fixed that situation. So what did we need the police for? Yeah, for sure. And nobody would, because we respected elders, the elders in the neighborhood, like, you know, I could be corrected by your mother yeah. or or his father if I did something wrong because we all respected each other as a community. The community itself was a family. I like to see it get back to that again. Absolutely. Not saying that it will, but it would be nice if it did. So to have dialogue, you're going to have to have unity. To have unity, you're going to have to have respect. To have respect, you're going to have to have elders. Somebody, everybody's not equal. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to be a high, hierarchy to say, make righteous decisions to say, okay, this is wrong. Because if you, even you talk about murder, a lot of people got murdered. And the thing about murder what back then was, okay, if you can protect your community, then you won't have any outsiders coming in your community murdering anybody. And if anybody from within the community itself murdered somebody, the community itself would deal with it, yeah. including perhaps killing that person. Yeah, sure. I mean, but there was, there was justice, even though it seemed like just straight out pandemonium, there was a justice a very efficient justice system set up within the hood. Yep. They didn't is, empty out half the population and put them in holding cells. Exactly. But. So we didn't need the system because yeah. we handled it ourselves. So it wasn't like, oh, there's no justice in the street. Anybody can do anything they want. They can kill anybody they want, and they don't have to pay the price because we're not going to stitch. No, that's not what it was. It was because this, the community, there was a thing called street law mm -hmm. and street justice that was very brutal yeah. if you did the wrong thing. Yeah. So there was justice. You know, the whole outlaw gang culture, you know, outlaw for us, the meaning of outlaw meant justice outside of the law. Yeah. It's not that we didn't have laws because we, in fact, gangs had very strict rules. Gangs had warlords and Gestapos that would get you in check if right. you didn't obey those rules. And we had the same thing on our block where certain guys, you would have to look, they would come after you if you broke the rules. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't break the rules because you feared these guys. And lock, you, you, you know, literally locked you up sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So, so it wasn't, it wasn't like it was lawlessness. Yeah. So people say, oh, you're not supposed to snitch. Well, I hear that. But who's going to pay the price for what this guy just did? Yeah. We're going to let him go scot-free? Yeah. No, it wasn't that way. So whatever it is now, that's what it is. But I'm just saying back then, there's a lot of things the generation that came after us did not understand about street justice and street law. It wasn't that it was lawlessness. It was that, that we handled it ourselves within the community. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody does something in the community and nobody wants to handle it, then the police are going to have to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who, who else is going to handle it? Are you just going to let the guy get away with it? Yeah. No, because then you just got lawlessness. Yeah. And everybody's doing whatever they want, which is why today you got people shooting each other because there's no consequences. There's going to have to be consequences. Well, I guess the consequences is, you know, you shoot this guy, his family's going to come and shoot you, yeah. and then it just goes back and forth with all the killing. And they want to get rid of guns, but you have to deal with the issues in the hearts of the people. Guns were around when I was a kid, in fact. If you give me a two by four, back then cars had these big antennas. We used to break off the antennas, nail it to a two by four, take a rubber band, and you can make a zip gun mm -hmm. in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't honorable because you did more things in hand-to-hand -hand combat because that was just more honorable. Where's honor? Yeah. Where's love? Yeah. You know, these things are missing. So I think if we bring back honor and love and respect, we can do things better than we're doing it right now. Yeah. 